Welcome to this episode of the Thinkers 360 video series. One of the most fascinating areas in marketing for the past few decades has been the rise of influencer marketing. While the celebrity aspect of influencers gets a great deal of exposure and attention, there's also a growing community of influencers in the enterprise space, and they've been shaking up marketing for some time. Joining us today to talk about how influencer marketing is helping organizations is Tom Augenthaler. Tom is the founder of influencer marketing consultancy 551 Media. He's been a pioneer in the area of influencer marketing and has some fascinating stories to share with us about how he got started in the field about 10 years ago. He's also an international speaker and recognized as one of the top 50 experts in the field by Talking Influence. Tom, welcome to uh, the Thinkers 360 video series. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me on. I'm thrilled to be here. Absolutely. You know, so I was going through your bio and I was fascinated by your own journey through influencer marketing. So much lately has been all about the celebrities, you know, the Kim Kardashians of the world. They get all the mm -hmm. attention. But this incredible opportunity to understand and to leverage influencer marketing in the enterprise space. You've been at it now for 10 years, and yet I've got to be honest with you, I still don't see a whole lot of folks in enterprises really understand what influencer marketing is. So begin us with sort of influencer marketing 101. What is it? How does it work? Yeah, okay. It's, it's, whether it's consumer or enterprise, it's pretty similar. And, and that is you're just trying to engage with people who have an audience and get them to talk about you, your products, your services, your brand, or whatever it happens to be. So <clears throat> it's, it's, it's about engaging with these people who have uh, accumulated an, an audiences of their own and um, engaging with them and uh, building relationships with them. And in that way, you're able to speak to your audience in a way that you wouldn't be able to do or you're not able to do just through your own content marketing or your own social media marketing. How, how much of that? So something that's been on my mind for a while, I've got a 21 year old and a 25 year old. And as they were growing up, I noticed something before we even began talking about influencer marketing as a term, they would say to me, you know, Hey dad, if I have to buy it because of an ad, I'm not going to buy it. They shouldn't have to convince me, right? I should know what's good. <laughs> And I, I noticed that peer pressure, we've all had peer pressure as we, as we were growing up, but in today's society with social media, peer pressure is so strong that generationally, this notion of influencer marketing, I know has roots in how they see the world. How much of it is that generational shift? Well, I think that that probably plays a part, but uh, influencer marketing, if you really think about it, you, like I, we were talking about just a few minutes ago, is boiling it down to its basics. It's really word of mouth. So it's you know, think about it in terms of just a personal perspective. When you're at dinner with friends and you know, somebody mentions at the table, hey, you know, I'm reading this book and it's really good. And you perk up a little bit because it sounds interesting to you. Well, that's that's word of mouth right there. You're, you're not being advertised that book. You're not being, you know, it's not being marketed to you in your face, you know, through social media or something. It's just another person relating to you uh, about something that you're interested in. And because you trust that person somewhat, you're more likely to listen to them about what their thoughts are pertaining to that. So <clears throat> that's really what it's all about. This whole notion of, of trust is a huge issue today, clearly, um, you know, <laughs> yeah. as, as we, right, for all kinds of reasons that we're not to get into. But it's a quagmire to talk about that because we have found it to be something that we need more of and yet seem to be getting less of. So the one-to-one -one connection with a friend, a colleague, becomes that much more important. Uh, the, the notion of being able to get information from a trusted source becomes absolutely critical. So if I look at influencer marketing and, and how it's evolved over the last 10 years, give us a sense for where it was and kind of how it grew up to where it is today. Because I know you have a great story that you tell from 2006 when you were at a large event and you got first introduced to the importance of influencer marketing. Maybe, maybe start there for us if you could. Yeah, sure. Um, I was at uh, HP and uh, everybody I think recognizes that as a huge technology company. I was part of their PR department. And um, in particular, I was uh, in a division at the time they called the, the PSG division of the personal systems group. And while in there, I handled uh, consumer laptops for uh, consumer laptops um, on a PR per from a PR perspective worldwide. So I was involved in how all of these products were going to be announced around the world in the different regions of the world. And at the time, we were looking for different ways to start engaging with 
the customer on a more direct level, or at least on a, uh, on a level that was a bit more personal. Because if you're dealing just through magazines and, re and, and professional reviewers, uh, that tends to be a very formal process. And magazines and reviewers have a have a, you know, they have a certain, I don't know, protocol that you've got to work through and everything else, which is all fine. Uh, but at, at the end of the day, we wanted to, we wanted to convey how these products were being engineered so that the end user would have an easier time with them, more fun with them, and that they were more versatile than what they might understand them to be. So the way that I started doing it was just working with bloggers initially, because back in 2006, 2007, blogging was a big deal. It was being talked about in the press quite a bit. Uh, you know, magazine articles are being written about it. Uh, so we started working with bloggers and the social media sites like Twitter and Facebook and, and such were really just sort of starting up and starting to gain a little bit of traction there. But um, one other thing about bloggers that I liked was the fact that they would take the product and they would, they would bring it into their own environment and they would use it there. Now, naturally I briefed them about the product and, and we, we educated them about, you know, who this was for ideally and what kind of a, a buyer would be buying this product. But, uh, you know, they would bring it into their own environment and then they would use it in these different scenarios and then they would blog about it. So they would take it to, you know, coffee shops if they were working and they would write about, hey, I'm working with this HP laptop and using it here. And hey, this is really great here. I really like this particular functionality. I love the way the keyboard feels, you know, things like that. And uh, what we ended up finding was is that they wrote these really, sometimes really long pieces uh, which was great long form content because um, uh, it made it, it made it the content very searchable and it was, it was easily findable uh, because at the time Google really didn't have a very sophisticated, you know, method yet or algorithm yet for, <clears throat> you know, for search and it hadn't gotten as competitive as it is now. So it made all of this content easily uh, you know, pop up when somebody was searching for something like a laptop or something. And the HP brand ended up coming up quite a bit. Uh, not only that, but we made friends with the, with the bloggers and developed relationships with them and ended up bringing a lot of them to different events around the world and things like that. So it really, it really ended up being its own marketing channel and opened up this whole vista of possibilities, which we, you know, we, of course, uh, ended up using. So you talk about it as a channel, and I have to wonder how much of a shift has happened between sort of the traditional marketing channels and this new channel of influencer marketing. How much of a role do you see it playing? Because again, going back to what I said earlier, a lot of companies I talk to, they sort of understand that there is this thing out there called influencer marketing, but when I look at what they're actually doing, they're barely scratching the surface of it. So why are they barely scratching the surface of it? Is there something that has yet to happen here to help evolve this, this as an industry to move it along. Yeah. Okay. So let's 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 think of influencer marketing as we learn about it now. So if you're new to it and you want to learn about it, your first thing you're going to do is go and search some articles up about it. Right. And those articles are nine times out of ten all going to be about statistics. They're going to yes. be about you know all these things about how brands are using it and just killing it. And then it's all going to most of it's going to be about consumer. So it's all going to be about beauty brands and fashion right. brands and 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 companies like that using it. And what they're not talking about is how enterprises are using it too. Mm -hmm. And the, the problem from the, the, from the media perspective is they don't understand it themselves from the, from the enterprise perspective, because I don't think a lot of them really understand enterprises right? Right. and how they operate. They think in terms of, well, hey, you can buy this product on Amazon, uh, you know, go get it, right? right. Um, have an influencer talk about it, link to it, click on the link, go buy the product. Well, yes. in an enterprise setting that it doesn't work that way. We, you know, it, you know, sales cycles are much, much longer. The products themselves are more complicated and, um, you know, sold through a particular process. You know, it usually involves a sales team and relationships between the executives right. and some of those uh, customer companies and prospective companies trying to develop relationships with them. So it's a it's a much more it's a it's a much longer, more involved process. But influencers can play a key role there. And they have they have been for quite a while, and I've been leveraging them for clients for you know since 2009 or so. Um, 
because at the time, back in 2009, when I left HP, as I was just saying a few minutes ago in their, their consumer division, I left to join a small consultancy that focused on influencer marketing. And once I joined them, HP Enterprise came knocking at the door saying, hey, we want to do some of this influencer stuff too. Can you help us? So I, I ended up working with them to uh, design and execute an influencer campaign or program that was always on. So it was uh, something that was just ongoing throughout the year. And, um, you know, it had its peaks and valleys in terms of activity, but it was always it was always ongoing. And, you know, we ran that for years with them. So, you know, and it ended up it ended up, you know, we talk, have found experts in servers and enterprise networking and enterprise storage and, uh, you know, you name it. Um, you know, we were we were finding influencers there. It was a lot harder in those days to find them. But now and nowadays it's a lot easier. But you know, enterprises can use influencers just as easily as any consumer brand that can. It's just a different, it's just a different, um, it's a different uh, activity. So it's much more relationship based. Um, now, again, if we go back to influencer marketing, what we're going to find online in terms of articles, if you break it down, there's three main activities that they talk about. The first is influencer advertising and that's mm -hmm. what you see so much about on 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 a platform like instagram right. it's really just finding influencers paying them to post about your shoes or yeah. your lipstick or whatever it happens to be and then uh, driving traffic to a landing page or some kind of a link or something right so <clears throat> it's it, it's very much about it as an advertising model the next the next activity is relations so some companies won't be doing so much of the advertising, but they want to invite influencers to their events, uh, whether it's an industry event or their own company event. And, you know, they'll bring the influencers in, you know, the, the influencers will cover the event, you know, blog about it, tweet about it, whatever, in, you know, Instagram about it, video about it, whatever they're doing. And then after the event's over, you know, everybody's done and they move on. But true influencer marketing is about co-creating content with the influencers. So you want to develop a relationship with them that's ongoing, long-term, and together you can pick each other's brains and figure out what's the best kind of content to reach the audience that the brand wants to reach because the influencer knows their audience better than you do because they're interacting with them on a daily basis or weekly basis. Every B2B influencer I work with has interactions with people in the back channel or the dark, dark social as they call it, right? So it's through text messages, it's emailing, it's whatever it happens to be. People are asking the influencers, hey, what about this? What about that? Am I thinking about this correctly? Because the B2B audience doesn't necessarily go out like the consumer, like consumers do and ask overt questions, right? Because right? if you're in a B2B enterprise, you don't want to look like a, a fool, number one. And number two, you don't want to tip your hand as to what might be you know, your enterprise might be struggling with, right? So you don't want to, mm -hmm. you don't want to necessarily give that information up. So you're going to ask people quietly and back channel, hey, you know, how are you approaching this? Or how, what are you seeing out there, right? right. Um, and, and, and in that way, an enterprise can really engage with influencers and really do some wonderful things. You know, so, so that last piece of it, the advertising model, we all get that. The relation model, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, I kind of get that. But this collaborative model, this co-creation model, I think is absolutely fascinating. And I, I would bet that when you talk to most enterprises about that, it's it's like Don breaking over Marvel head. They've just never thought about it quite quite that way. But it's an entirely different way to engage with your marketplace. And it works especially well in a B2B setting, in an enterprise setting, as opposed to a B2C setting where, where the advertising model obviously tends to predominate right now. Where, if you were to put, a, and I'm going to put you on the spot here because I'm just curious uh, for, for myself, my own edification. If you were to say how many large corporates, not just the Fortune 500, but you know, small to medium sized businesses and larger businesses that are heavy into marketing, B to B, how many of them actually get that third model? What kind of a number would you put on it from a percentage standpoint? Fifty percent, twenty percent, seventy percent? Oh boy, I I'd say fifteen to twenty percent of the B to B enterprises little. out there really wow. um, are really doing it to the to the fullest potential. Most yeah. of them, most of them dip their toe in the water. So yeah. they'll, they'll invite a few influencers to an event. Right. And they'll, they'll, you know, say, Hey, you know, 
we'll pay you a couple of thousand dollars to come yes. to the event and, and, and blog about it or something or, or shoot some video about the event. But that's your you second model. That's your relation model. Yeah, it's, that's it's the relationship right. part, right. Um, but uh, in terms of doing co-creative content, very few. Wow. And it's a shame because if you think about it, most of these enterprises are pumping out content right. on a weekly basis. So right. they're putting out blog posts, they're putting yeah. out articles, they're paying for sponsored articles, right? They're they're doing webinars, right? Especially webinars right now yeah. are a big deal with this corona lockdown that we're all in, right. this quarantine that we're all in. You know, B2B salespeople cannot travel right now. Right. So what do you do? Well, you hold Zoom calls and you know you hold more webinars, right? And and any event that any enterprise was thinking of holding this year is probably either on hold or they're thinking of holding it in a virtual sense. So <clears throat> why not roll in some influencers into that to help make the content a heck of a lot more engaging and exciting for your audience? So, so here's an outrageous thought. I mean, in many ways, COVID-19 has been a watershed moment for things like Zoom, uh, for online conferencing, for, for video, what we're doing right now, right? Mm -hmm. Will it also be a watershed for influencer marketing? Because what you just said makes a great deal of sense. And I think that by and large, the bar has been set so low for webinars. Uh, maybe it's time to up that bar. Maybe this crisis will be part of what moves us along. Or is that being Pollyanna-ish by being too optimistic? There? I, 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 I think to a degree it really is happening. And, and it's, it's something that it's hard to gauge while something's happening, right? I think right. we need a quarter to go by before we're going to understand what happened in this quarter. You know, third quarter, we'll understand what happened in second quarter a little bit better. Mm. Um, but I, I do think that there are shifts happening. So on the consumer side of things, a lot of enterprise, a lot of, a lot of B2C companies uh, are pulling back on their ad budgets. They're pulling back on budgets for events because they're not going to be held physically. So, you know, they're, they're scrambling now. Do we just put the event on hold and, and, and hold something virtually or just do it? Vir what are we going to do here? Right. Mm -hmm. So they're pulling back a lot of their budget. That means a lot of the influencer activity has decreased on the B2B side of things. I'm seeing an increase in activity because, B2B enterprises now have to do something a bit differently. They've been doing things the same old way for like the last 30 years. And now there's an opportunity. Now they're actually being forced to rethink, how are we going to do our marketing and how are we going to do our, our events? How are we going to, how are we going to sell a bit differently? Right? So now this whole topic of digital selling is coming up and <clears throat> that's changing the way, uh, B2Bs are, are having to rethink getting in front of customers and prospects. So why not roll influencers into that? Because the influencers are out there. They're just they're waiting to be engaged by, by your brand. So, uh, you know, uh, co-host a webinar with them. Um, uh, if you're doing a virtual conference, reach out to some influencers and ask them if they are willing to participate on some of the panels that you're holding or maybe host a panel or even better yet, what if, what if they do a keynote? Mm -hmm. Right. Because they're experts in their fields and you might as well leverage outside experts to talk about what's going on, uh, because there's no way that your own enterprise is an expert on everything there. There's just no way. So, I mean, not only is this more cost effective with budgets being pulled back, but in some ways, companies are doing more of it in a B2B sense because it simply is more effective. End of story. I mean, it's, it's, it's digital. Uh, I get that. It's easier to deliver digital than it is face-to-face -face or re real in-person events. But I think in some ways, we're realizing that the power of the medium here, the digital medium, is one that we haven't fully exploited. And this could be one of those areas where we haven't really put enough muscle behind it to see what the value truly is. I mean, going back to B2C, by the way, you've probably seen these too. I've, I've worked with B2C companies that do influencer marketing, and they have these NORAD-like rooms where they track the number of clicks and what happens you know, yeah. after a, a, you know, a, an opening is done by, a, by an influencer or an opening of a package of a consumer product. Uh, you can't do that in B2B. I mean, you, you're, you're, what you're pushing is much softer, and you don't see the immediate, well, or do you? Well, it's a different animal, so you don't really necessarily care about right. all of these you know, a, a lot of what the the consumer companies track is all the social media activity. Exactly. exactly. That's nice. And, it, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with getting a lot of social media activity around your, your brand, or your products. But at the same time, is that motivating your B2B buyer to right. to take the next step and download that ebook yeah. so that you have a lead? Right. right, right. So, uh, you know, just because there's a lot of likes and 
shares and things like that. I don't think that that necessarily motivates mm -hmm. the B2B buyer or the prospective B2B buyer to, to take an action. Yeah. I think that it's much, it's gotta be much more thoughtful. So if you can get your B2B prospects to enroll in a webinar or to download an ebook or to download a research paper that you've, you know, co-authored with a, a, an analyst or something. I mean, you're, that's the kind of activity that you really, really want to see, right? It's, it, and the, like I said, the social media stuff is fine, but again, that doesn't necessarily drive the B2B uh, marketplace where it needs to be. On the consumer side of things, it's FOMO, right? So if I'm, if I'm into this particular kind of sneaker or something, and I see a lot of these influencers like liking and sharing and, and commenting on these new sneakers that have come out and that, you know, and I'm a sneaker aficionado, that might motivate me to go, okay, boom, I need to go buy those. Um, but, and that's, that's FOMO, right? It's like, well, if I don't buy them now, they're not going to be around next week. So I might as well get them now. Right. A B2B buyer can't think that way. So for instance, uh, you know, nobody buys, and this is an analogy I like to use, nobody buys a Komatsu tractor mm -hmm. uh, because of an Instagram post right. or because there's a lot of likes on an Instagram post with a picture of a Komatsu tractor. It just doesn't happen that mm -hmm. way, right? I mean, it's a, it, you're talking about a, probably a, I don't know, million dollar piece of machinery. So it, it's going to be a thoughtful, it's going to be a, a process that's involved in that sale. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's salespeople that are, that are involved there. There's relationships, like I said before, and it's going to be carefully thought out because the person buying that machinery, if it's not the owner of the business themselves and it's some higher up, well, you're going to be damn sure they're going to make a careful decision right. because they don't want to buy a tractor that's not suitable for what they need. Right. Yeah. So, and then on top of it these days, it's not just the tractor that is valuable, but it's the data that Komatsu can give you on the tractor as well. How is it performing, right? I mean, when do you need to get it serviced? Uh, you know, all this type of stuff. I mean, all, all you know, the write down on it, you know, the, as, a, as a piece of equipment. So all of this stuff comes into play and it's, a, it's, a, it's just a much more thought out logical sale than an emotional sale on consumer side. A lot of the a lot of purchasing is 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 emotional, right? right? It's like it's like real estate, right? It's like if you're going to sell real estate as a residential agent, as opposed to a a a a, um, um, a commercial agent, mm -hmm. it's a completely different situation. Nobody goes to rent a factory. So, you know, rent, rent rent factory space based on oh yeah I like the paint scheme here you know it's <laughs> it's on it's on the facility itself it's on its location right it's on uh, ease of access it's on how up to date is the is the is the facility right is it got enough loading bays is it got you know all these different factors are included so it's a completely different model but the the influencers for the B two B arena are all out there you just need to find them. And finding them can be a little bit of a challenge at times. So let me, so let me bridge to that because you just went to exactly where I wanted to go. Before we wrap this up, let's talk about how you find these influencers uh, because there, there are platforms like Thinkers360, obviously. But when you walk in an organization, I would imagine the first question you get if you're consulting on influencer marketing is, so how do I find them? What do you do? How do you go about that? And making well, sure I, the, I, the right people, not because there's a lot of stuff out there on the web. I can make myself look like an influencer. doesn't mean I necessarily am. Yeah. Um, well, that's one of the benefits of the thinkers platform. And, and the more I engage with the thinkers platform, the more I like it because yeah. thinkers is really about thought leaders, right? And so this is about people who go out and do a lot of public speaking. They write books, they author articles, they uh, write for publications. They, you know, they're contributors there. They have their own blogs. They probably, a lot of them have their own businesses. So they're consultants right? They're independent analysts. So it's a great starting point. So you can go in there and just look at the leaderboards for your particular area, right? And I, and the thinkers uh, community has, gosh, it's got more leaderboards than I can even count at this point. Um, but that being said, uh, you can also, you can also look for people on, on the best social platform is, is LinkedIn. Any professional um, who's doing business today is on LinkedIn to some degree or other, and you can find them there. 
Um, and of course, you can go the usual route by looking at uh, trade publications and business publications too, because all of those publications have opened the doors up a little bit right. um, to one degree or other to contributed writers. So they're not necessarily reporters, but yeah. they're business people who are, all, who, are, who are contributing content to those publications. So that's a great place to look for people too. Uh, so those three things right there, just do a Google search, uh, look on LinkedIn, and of course you look at thinkers. And right there, you're gonna come up with some influencers, I guarantee it. You know, it's, it's a fascinating space. Uh, I'm not surprised when you say about 15% or so of the enterprises that you've come in contact with are, are doing anything sincere in this, in this regard. But I can't believe that's not going to, it's got to change. I mean, I can't believe it's not going to change over the course of the next few months, especially since we're all in this digital mode. Um, but it is, it is a space that, unfortunately, I think to, to a large degree, uh, requires a bit of a deep dive. You have to dive in and understand it um, at, at, a, at, a, at, a, you know, at a at a level that's more than superficial, which most folks get today when they look at the B two C side of this. Yeah. So most of the tools out there for the for the for influencer marketing are all geared for consumer right. type brands, right? So whether you're a small brand or you're a, an enterprise, there are tools out there. Most of them are geared towards that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, the but the, it's not the tool that makes the strategy, right? It's mm -hmm. not the tool that right. makes it a, a marketing channel. What, what makes it a marketing channel is understanding your objectives, your buyer personas, and then and then crafting a strategy that's going to speak to those personas. So on the on the enterprise side, you might not need, um, you know, hundreds of influencers. Mm -hmm. And actually, you probably yeah. don't. Right. Uh, you just need maybe a dozen or two dozen that are yeah. really high quality people who speak to your target personas. And one of the ways that I like to look at this is um, I think that I think that as, as marketers, we tend to get caught up in niches. So it's like, mm -hmm. well, if I'm if I'm selling a sneaker product, I only need sneaker. Uh, I, you know, I, I only look for influencers who, who are into sneakers. Well, OK, okay of course. Well, that you're going to want some of those. Yes, probably a high percentage of those. But in terms of influencer marketing, think of building a mosaic. So your picture is made up of many little tiles and the influencers are, are, are those tiles and your mosaic can have some large tiles in there or can have many, many small tiles, right? Like the ancient mosaics, you see the ancient Romans and Greeks. So <clears throat> either way you can look at it, it's a mosaic because there are going to be influencers that talk about sneakers that don't necessarily focus on sneakers. They might be more of a lifestyle type type influencer, or mm. they might talk about, you know, I don't know, fitness products or something like that. So it's, it's, you're going to want to find influencers from different niches and cobble them together to create that holistic whole, that mosaic, that picture that then speaks to the, you know, your, your target personas. And then the same thing is true in the B2B enterprise. So if you're, if you're, if you're just about enterprise networking, for instance, well, Enterprise networking entails more than just enterprise networking products, right? It involves some storage, it involves servers, it involves, you know, all these other other products as well. And then you've got to have the, you know, the people who implement it, right? So who are the people that actually go into an enterprise and, 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 and build this out? So you're going to want some of those influencers as well. So again, you're building a mosaic, a picture. Uh, that's going to speak to your target personas in the in the most holistic way possible. That, that's a great visual with which to, to end this. Uh, you are a wealth of knowledge when it comes to this space. I mean, I've learned a lot just listening to you. Uh, thank you for sharing some of it with us. Really do appreciate your time, Tom. Happy to be here. Thank you for having me. And we'll provide a link so that folks want to follow up with you and find out more about influencer marketing. They can, they can do so. Folks, thanks very much for joining us for this episode of the Thinkers360 video series. Look forward to seeing you again soon in a future episode. I'm Tom Kolopoulos. Thanks for joining us.